Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I hope you've had a great summer and uh, I know that uh, the audience looks small because <laughs> we might have just reached the last hooray on, <laughs> on Labor Day, but um, people are still recovering from that heat. Oh my God, mm -hmm. that heat. Yeah. Um, so, but we do often have like huge numbers on the live stream. That's so, good. Um, and people continue to watch that. But anyway, thanks all for coming and attending. And I'm going to pass it over to David. David's a fabulous moderator, and uh, he does a wonderful <laughs> summary sometimes after a chat um, of his little uh, tidbits that you take out of these chats, which is very helpful. And uh, uh, we post it on LinkedIn. Okay, so I'll pass Actually, it over I'm already mic, so you can hold okay. on to that mic. <laughs> but hold on to that because when we get to yes. questions, good. So. Um, hello everyone, my oh, name is David Spark. Sorry. Yes. I'm really sorry, I always forget this, our sponsor. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Please, thank <laughs> you for Peter's hosting. Got, Peter's going to say a few words about um, Startup Basecamp. All right, thanks for coming out everyone. Um, again, my name is Peter Dang. I am the Community and Events Manager here at Startup Basecamp. Um, we are San Francisco's first startup hotel. Um, we host international um, startup professionals from around the globe who come in and we help them launch their business here in Silicon Valley. We're providing them with co-working. the mints that go on the pillow, by the way? Uh, of course, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> we provide co-working, co-living, and um, we help build connections here, um, just even between our guests and then also um, they're going to meet people here that they want to connect with in the future. So we're helping facilitate those interactions. So again, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And um, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for watching. And uh, is the stream live now? Are we up on? All right. Well, I will share that in but a moment. We have just a handful. Of... Now, are you guys working or are you participating over here in the best? You know, you can come closer too, by the way. I think all three, all three of us bathed today, so we don't yeah. smell that bad, so it's not okay. Uh, but we have Robison, is that your first name? We have Gabrielle, I can't read your... It's Honorbon. Honorbon? Yeah. All right. Uh, Matt, Kanad, and I don't know what your name is? The Peach. The Peach? The Peach, yeah. And then, I'm sorry, the two people who are joining us are... Like my t-shirt? Fa yeah. Fail I'm fast, sure succeed faster. <laughs> Well, what is your Barbara, which is my mom's name. I don't mean any woman of your age named Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, you're in Frank, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. So I'm David Spark. I own a content marketing firm specifically for B2B tech companies. And I've been doing a lot of stuff with Pimo and FinTech and startups as well. I've also covered a lot of hackathons. And I really enjoy moderating these events, a lot of fun. So let me introduce the two people who are gonna be on the panel. We're gonna be talking about fundraising 101. We're gonna get into, where I'm gonna have a sort of a clarifying question, but to my immediate left is Ashley Bittner, who is the principal at Owl Ventures. And to her left, and also to my left, but her, to more her immediate left, is Phil Boyer, senior associate at Crosslink Capital. All right, the topic is fundraising 101. And when Ashley and I spoke earlier on the phone, talking about this, we were going to assume that everybody already has a seed level of funding. We don't need to talk about how to get friends and family funding, or do you want to talk about that? Are we all kind of cool on, you know, uh, getting a few bucks to just get something going, all right? We're going to start talking about after that. You've already started with the idea. Okay, so we're getting that out of the way. We're cool. All right. If someone wants to talk about that, we can. Don't feel shy. Okay. We're talking like a million and less? Or I'm talking like you, like not even, you, we're talking first dollars, period. Okay. Yeah. You've gotten your first dollars, yes. your very first dollars. So okay. Our first cool. institutional round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First inst okay, cool. All right. So we're going to assume seed level, and we're going to also assume you have some semblance of a business plan, yes? Can we all assume that? Yes. If you don't, please feel free to speak up. All right, awesome. Okay. So. Fundraising 101, Ashley, Phil, let's just talk to me about this in very much a uh, very much an outline form. What are the basic sort of structure of funding? I'm really ignorant on this because I've never I own a company, but I you know it's all self-funded. So, what are the basic sort of structure of funding that one should think about now that I've sort of started something? Um. 
Can we start? Go ahead. All right. So you can do the first half, and Phil can sounds great. <laughs> fill up the second. Half. I'll talk about the stage, and maybe we can talk a little bit about even the who should raise venture fund. Yeah. Oh, yeah, talk yeah. About a little I got plenty of questions, so we'll just great. go back. Up. Oh, by the way, I don't wait till the last fifteen minutes for questions. If you have questions at any time, just speak up. Don't don't hesitate. Um, speak up. Okay. Great. So let's just start talking about the basic outline yes. of funding. Um, I'm just going to so share this. The basics. Uh, so we mentioned, you know, angel, kind of friends and family rounds you might raise to kind of get off the ground. And we're talking about once you're going to institutional investors, so people who are providing institutional capital from limited partners or other folks uh, to invest in your business. And so this is when you might do um, a note or you might do an equity, like a traditional round, price round, which we can talk about more. So there's mm -hmm. the seat. So usually friends and family, angels, a seed rounds. You could have angels in there, but you might have institutional funding. You have a Series A, B, C, and then beyond, right? Um, we tend to invest my fund at OWL, uh, which is a tech-focused. We call it post-product market fit, uh, which means uh, you are out there selling something generally. You have revenue or attraction, um, usually the Series A or Series B. Uh, as opposed to doing your very first institutional dollars, which I think Phil is better positioned to talk about because you actually <laughs> so so invested is, that stage. So, but what does that mean, Series A? I mean, uh, I just know it's the beginning, but what does that mm -hmm. mean? Well, there's a difference of like development of your company where you take different amounts of funding to achieve different objectives. So at a Series A, when we say your post-product market fit, and please jump in here because I know mm -hmm. you do this as well, um, your you have a product that's out there, you have revenue or customers, you have some semblance of a repeatable sales process going after a certain size market opportunity. So you're out there you're, and you have traction you're selling and now when you're raising money from us, it's because you're gonna go scale. So it's not necessarily, you might do some product development around there, but a lot of what we're investing in is like products there, we have clear demand from the market and now you and you have the idea or you have the beginnings of a repeatable sales process to go after a big market opportunity and now we're going to help you go scale that um, is typically the place where we are. So it's not in the, the initial product development, it's not the initial kind of hires typically for us, mm -hmm. um, but we do have a couple of seed investments. That okay, are so that's Series A? That's Series A. Um, and Series B is a, a growth, it's where you start getting to the, the real growth stages, but seed is okay, kind so of early what, projects. Okay, so and then maybe this, I'm sure this is an amorphous talk, topic, excuse me, <laughs> but you need to scale at Series A. What is the different definition between scale and growth? Do you want to take well, that? I, I was <laughs> going to say the, the one thing um, just on the last topic is that I, I think the um, definitions of these things have been changing. Yes, and they have. Um, also amounts of capital has definitely been changing yes. at each of these yes. stages. So. Um, you know, we, we invest at Crosslink mostly in seed and Series A. Um, so we were talking about already getting your seed round done, being fam friends and family. I think in the past there was friends and family and then there was Series A, a and yep. Series A was the first institutional round. I think but that's you, kind of changed. Friends and family, then seed, then Series A? Yes. So yeah, so now that's kind of what it's evolved to. Where so the, the people you see yeah. have had a little bit of money, like can show something. Usually, and sometimes we are the first money in. Actually, um, okay. they maybe bootstrapped uh, the business to start and didn't raise any capital at all, um, or it's an entrepreneur that maybe we knew from uh, you know a prior company. So they had yeah. maybe past success, right? And you're willing, right? To and so their first round of capital might be a little bit larger than a, a, a typical you know friends and family okay. round. But um, but I think that there is an important point that Ashley made that I think it's less so about the amount of capital at each stage; and it's much more about the milestones you're yes. trying to reach. So. Okay. For a seed, I think you're trying to put together your product, yes. um, get it to place uh, to a place where it's marketable, maybe get some early customer traction, yes. some data points, um, some early revenue, and then you raise the Series A to prove that your business model actually can work yes. and that uh, you can get some early elements of product market fit. Yep. And then once you uh, get that product, you know, early signs of product market fit, whatever that is, that's a whole other discussion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, then you can raise a Series B, which is usually more to prove your uh, customer acquisition yes. economics work, um, and then once you do that, then it's kind of right. everything from there is more scale capital. The customer economics work, let's pile on a bunch of cash and yeah. get it to as big a business as possible. Yes, Gabrielle. Hold it, can we get a mic for him? Pima. Just so it's on that audio right there. Thank you. So for you, um, my question is, because you guys invest in seed stage, mm -hmm. How much of a consideration is it beyond financial that your name comes from? Sorry. <laughs> Start Hello? <laughs> Hello? Do you hear me? No, no, is yeah, it? Yeah. He can okay. hear you. He's you can hear me? Okay. So how much of a consideration is it for you when you invest in a seed stage company 
financial as opposed to having your name listed as a lead because I get mm. that sense that a lot of times people, yeah. it's not even, even about the money necessarily, mm. it's about being first on Crunchbase. Well, so I think there's, there's a couple things that actually may, might be even outside of what you said. So one thing is ownership is really important mm -hmm. um, to a lot of venture investors and a lot of institutions in particular. And, and the, the reason behind that is because um, if you're a, a venture firm, there's only so many you know, investments uh, you can make out of that fund. Um, and only so many of those are going to be super duper successful. Um, and so you need to have uh, a, a good amount of ownership in those businesses in order to you know, return a lot of capital on those funds. Um, so I know at least for, for Crosslink, we are definitely ownership sensitive. We're typically going to be a lead investor um, or a co-lead at least uh, in a seed or series A. So we have ownership targets that we're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. um, and so t more often than not, that means you're going to be a lead investor versus other funds uh, at the seed stage, some of them are less ownership sensitive. Yeah. They're willing to take a smaller uh, bite of the round and maybe be a follow on investor. Mm -hmm. um, and in those cases, you know, they're not necessarily the first one on the list, but they might be, you know, third, fourth or fifth. Okay, so and that's walk, walk, walk me through that a little bit more. How critical is being a lead investor? I mean, if there's something hot, you mm -hmm. can't, someone's already in as a lead investor, but you want to be in on this. Or are you just going to be in on it? or It depends on the, well, I think it depends on the fund's approach to investing. It's part of your investment thesis. And certainly that could, you might want to participate because you think that could, that small percentage might return your fund. It's kind of, do you want to do more concentrated where you don't expect to have a bunch of zeros or are you doing a broader range of investments where you're hoping that your small ownership percentage returns the capital for you. So it's more around like your philosophy, your investment thesis and how you approach investing. So for us, we have led all but one of our investments and the one that we didn't lead was also a unique opportunity where we thought it was the economics of it still made sense for us um, to participate in that round. Okay. So it really depends on the fund. And your classic is also mostly lead investor. We're typically lead investor. And I think another important distinction to make is um, I guess the role you take when you, when you are a lead investor sure. typically if you're leading the round, you're going to be the most active yes. um, investor. You might be on the board. Yes. Uh, we're for Series A. If we're leading, we're generally on the board. Uh, at the seed stage, we can, you know, do a board observer. It just kind of depends on what the situation is. But um, that's a, I mean, that's a huge critical distinction because a lot of times there's a different investment models that might uh, make a ton of investments out of each fund smaller check sizes and are not leading rounds because that'd be impossible to do. Right. You wouldn't be able to add um, unique enough value to each company as a follow on investor. Yeah. So that's a big distinction. So follow on, you have like, you have no sort of control. It's just, you're, it's, you're just making an investment. You're hoping I wouldn't say no rest. control. I wouldn't say no control. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely follow on investors that add a ton of value. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just a, li a little bit of a lighter touch model because yeah. you're not, you're not going to make, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 investments out of each fund. You're yeah. going to make, you know, maybe hundreds of investments right. out of each fund. So to each Well, that company. also requires yeah. a lot more research and understanding of if you're dealing with 100 investments versus 20. That's just a lot more work. Well, I think, you know, hopefully yeah. each, each <laughs> firm is giving the same amount of work. I think it's a more, are you going to spend, you know, an exorbitant amount of your time with uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 companies, yes. or are you going to spend right. a little bit of time with, you know, hundreds of companies? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we talked, yes, you have a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, how do you advise uh, 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 to a founders or uh, entrepreneurs like uh, where like uh, <coughs> you need to develop uh, some uh, deep technology or enterprise class product where you need a, like even in a product development you need a few millions of dollars without it is going into the market, right? And which is not easily available through the uh, seed fund or like angel fund or fam friends and family funds. Yeah, one minute. Yeah, for it, yeah. The, the, um, I think, you know, at the each stage, again, it's, the, it's, it's going to be different things that you're, you're going to have to convince the investor yeah. of, at, at, depending on the stage. So, you know, for, for friends and family, obviously, we're not going to talk about that, but that's more about just kind of gathering people that know you, right, and have a connection to you and are, and are excited about investing in uh, your, your project. For uh, seed round, um, you know where we come in there. It's it's you're going to have way less proof points, and you kind of those investors are 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 generally more geared toward making those types of bets. Uh, but they're going to be invest they're investing in the people. So uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, but um, at the seed stage especially and Series A even, you're really investing in the people 
more so than anything else and the market, right? So you're going to be looking at the market size and making sure that there's, you know, given all the dynamics of all the players in that market, that there's room for a, a new entrant or maybe some unique model that that, that company uh, might bring to bear. Um, and then you're going to invest in, you know, the founding team as to whether we think they have a really good chance of uh, reaching product market fit and going after that and proving out the milestones to get to the Series A, which becomes more about kind of traction and yeah. things like that. Oh, can I go back to a yeah. previous question I had that I didn't feel was answered? And that is, I still want to know what's the difference between scale and growth? Because um, you said A is scale, B is growth. Well, it's his point right? around. Right or wrong? Uh, more or less, but it was kind of his, he made a point around there's a difference between uh, proving out, so there's proving product market fit, which is a whole other conversation, then there's the customer acquisition, and there's growth. And so there's a growth is pour money on something that's working, get bigger, bigger, Got bigger. Okay, Scaling so is, you, you might at the seed stage have like a pilot, you might have some initial customers, you might have, you know, it varies tremendously based on the market you're going after. So some of our companies, they might have three customers, but those are multi-million dollar contracts, right? Or you might have 20 million, you, you know, there's just ranges of traction, but um, it's a r much more around, um, seed is more like early, kind of product, early traction. Series A is like you're trying to create the repeatability around it, you're scaling, and then your growth is when you have a process that's working and you're throwing more Got capital. For Series so A, no, I think that's, and that's Series A right is on. where you're experimenting with how you're going to grow. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's still, you have a thesis around it and you have mm -hmm. a process. You might have like a sales, maybe you have a head of sales or not. You might be founder-led sales still, and you have a hypothesis around creating a repeatable process around it, and you're gonna go and scale that. So you might go, you might hire, you might go hire ahead of sales. You might get a, your first sales team, the first couple of hires in that space. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you probably don't have that prior to the Series A. And okay. I've heard people say it, like in the Series A, a lot of times you're, or even seed, seed in Series A, your your um, your sales are in beta at that point. Like you're, yeah. you have you know early proof points that you're starting to prove out, but you don't, you don't have you know, a repeatable yes. model necessarily yet. I think for the Series B is really where it comes yes. to, you know, nailing down that you have a repeatable model for if you put in these amount of dollars, this amount's going to come out. And then for the Series C, it's like, at that point, that better be pretty well defined. Um, and then that's really where the scale comes in. You dump a lot of money into that. Um, and there's all kinds of challenges that come with so, scaling. So how is Series, is Series C just a larger version of Series B? Well, there's like early stage investors, like what we do, and there's mm -hmm. like growth stage investors. And it's a total different skill set, honestly, around like what support you're providing, I think, to a company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so early stage is a lot around like market validation, entrepreneurs, like early stage business models. And for our case, mm -hmm. like we're vertically focused, so expertise around a particular market. Right. And when you're getting into the more growth, it is, it's more of a financial, I don't say it's not only a financial transaction, but it's yeah. more around like, uh, it's just a different style of investing. Yeah, and, and those those firms are going to uh, assess your business in a different way. Yes. So it's, I think, e yeah, even B two C, there's you start to see different types of investors show up in those rounds when later rounds, and so they're they're as you go further and further and further, it turns more into kind of the metrics of the business yes. and more into becoming almost like a public company yes. over time. Okay, so can I assume from everyone in this room who's working sort of, no one's ready for B or C right now. You're looking for C or A. Like, you know, you've done the framework, you're looking for it. Can I kind of assume that? Yes? All right, so let's focus on that right now. What, let's talk, what, you, you, you did talk about this earlier, but let's go into a little more detail. What do you need to see? We'll start with seed, and we're gonna assume friends and family already, they've got a little, they've created a product, they can show something, maybe mm -hmm. they got a customer or two. Uh, what do you need to see for you to give a seed round? What needs to happen at this point? Yeah, it kind of go back, goes back to your, your question there. I mean, I think at the seed, it's, again, it's much more about team. Who, who, who's going out? I think it's market and it's team yes. much more than product and traction at yes. the seed. So, um, you know, we're going to, it's going to be a lot about does that investor you're talking to have a thesis in the space, uh, meaning do they think, you know, the market you're going after is super interesting and there's room for sharps to be built in this in this market. Yeah. Um, and does, do we have conviction that this is the yes. right team to back in this in this given market? Um, I think that's much more about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Product's probably early on, so it's gonna be hard to say where product goes, but yeah. you're betting on the team to really mold product to fit that market. And what if you have an incredibly young team that doesn't really have a history? 
how can you, mm -hmm. you know, build a, uh, a, well, build trust in them, I guess. Well, I what think it's, think? In, I'll, I'll, you do yeah. more of this kind of thing, but I think it's, um, then it's also around, like, early proof points. So I think it's a little bit around, um, at least for us, you know, we look at those kinds, um, we see, you might have, you, then it's, your product's gonna matter a little bit more, I think, and mm -hmm. your, um, it's, it's gonna be harder to raise just on a piece of paper, which uh, we've done some, our seed investments have been more like that, like a proven entrepreneur who's exited a, a company for over a billion dollars and then we do some education, we're like, okay, we, we will seed that because we have confidence in that. Well, well, for the it, not- Has anyone here exited on a billion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So <laughs> when you do not have that, then I do think it's around, like, we want to have some, like, a little bit of proof points. So that okay. might be, um, the like, an MVP of the product. It might be, okay. like, your first couple of customers. You're going it, it, you, and you can do, like, bits of it, like, right? It doesn't have to be the full business, but you have to start having the pieces of so it. So early together. customers, MP, MVPs, yes. anything else? And everyone, hold it, everyone knows what MVP stands for, right? And then it's the same things. It's still, like, around team. Like, do you have... Um, a, some kind of unique background that still makes you uniquely qualified to go after this. Do, do you have the ability to attract talent? Can you mm -hmm. help grow that team? Um, things of that nature. And then is the market really interesting? Like, do you have this unique perspective on this really big market um, that will, it makes it attractive? So it's Yeah, I, I think, it, I think it's also like it becomes more about the story. So yes. it's, it's going to be a lot easier to raise capital if you have like, you know, a, yeah. a big exit in the background. But most, most people don't yeah. when, yeah. They, when they, you know, come to the office. So you it's, get sold on a story? Totally. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're buying into a story. Give me an example of a story you got sold on. Um, okay. And then I see that. <laughs> From yeah. someone who literally really young, there was really no past evidence. Like okay. Popped out of college, nothing. Okay. Well, I oh, had a different story. <laughs> someone didn't talk. Okay, well, didn't story. Like <laughs> well, the original one I was thinking of is, is a company called Descartes Labs um, in our portfolio. They're an AI company for satellite imagery mostly today. But the background of it was, um, you know, the CEO. And by the way, there was no, we were the first capital in the business. There was no capital before. Um, the CEO had come across a, um, you know, a CTO and a, a bunch of a technologists that were in Los Alamos Labs, National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And the CEO, he, his background had nothing to do with the market they were going after. It was more in media and these kind of different areas. But um, he just kind of fell in love with the technology that was being built within these, these labs. And he saw a lot of opportunity um, to be used for more commercial use cases as opposed to you know, government type use cases. So you know, came in the office and he was showing, originally he was showing us demos of um, what they could do with Vine videos um, by recognizing like cats and different things within these Vine videos. But, the extension and the leap of faith you had to make was that they were going to be able to take this technology and apply it to satellite imagery um, and recognizing really interesting things on the globe and being able to cr create correlations for predictive outcomes. Um, so that was a leap of faith to make, but... This is just like from the <laughs> TV show Silicon Valley, it's a hot dog, if you remember. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. The show exactly is not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> hot dog, exact not same story, dog. that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, you made the leap of faith, they could identify cats. Well, yeah, so... Cats was just, that was a, that was a uh, 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 I guess, demo of the technology that it could work. But the, uh, the, the leap of faith you had to make was that they could take that technology and be able to recognize other really interesting things about what's going on on the planet over 40 plus years of satellite imagery and then use those insights to create predictive um, models for a bunch of different use cases. And we had to, we had to believe that there were use cases in agriculture uh, financial services, um, government, insurance, a whole how long bunch of different markets. Did you put the money in there? Uh, we, we originally invested, I believe it was in 2014, end of 2014. And so um, have they been able to? So they just raised that? a Series B at $30 million. Okay. Series so they're B, doing well. So they're, they're doing well. Um, All right, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, and have you ever been sold? Oh, you don't do C. Well, You're we have some, a. but it's uh, typically been an, an experienced entrepreneur that yeah, okay. is doing, they're doing another like they've done something in a different sector and they're applying it into All right, well, this education. is good advice. Have an MVP, have some early customers, have a unique background, can you attract talent, and get sold on the story. So be able to yeah. connect the dots, if you will. Yes. And I'd say when you pitch, like starting with your, like not a very long story, but like your background is helpful. Some folks will just launch into like a business plan and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> like, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and like why but you like, care about this thing? <laughs> I, I would, I, let me just, I'll get to your question in a second. I'm always, there's a gentle balance of that because aren't you aggravated by the person who comes to pitch you 
And in their deck, they spend a lot of time on like That's the why founders. I said concise. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like concise. give me less than a minute. Yeah. <laughs> like on. Because that always drives me crazy. I'm like, just get to the idea. I agree. <laughs> but when you go like when I don't know anything about you until like twelve slides in, mm -hmm. like it's it's kind of like why are why are you uniquely positioned to tackle this problem? Is yeah. what I want to like start so, with. So that frame. that's okay. Why are you just answer that question? Yeah. Why are you uniquely yeah. positioned to uh, tackle this problem? Okay. And yes. Oh question. wait wait wait. Get on the microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So question trying to connect the dots. So there's an MVP, right? What about if it's a disruptive technology leading to an MVP? Question number one, allow me to finish this. Mm -hmm. And then you have a proof of concept partner without a letter of intent. How do you connect these dots? What are you looking for? So that part, I get it. There's a team which can deliver on that. Mm -hmm. But then how do you connect these dots now? So I'm repeating, it's disruptive leading to an MVP. So there is no baseline for me to talk about. And the second part is proof of concept partner is ready, but LOI still work in conversation of our work in progress, whatever the right jargon is. How do you assess that situation from a series A and slightly before, whatever you want to call that? Um, I'll try to tackle that one. I, mean, I, think, I think there's, again, there's, there's each, there's, there's a progression here, right? So there's um, a lot of times early on in, this, in a seed company, maybe a er very early seed round, there's, like you said, there's, there's impressive technology that you can show um, and there's maybe early signs of an MVP or proof of concept, and you might have some early um, customers that are raising their hand saying, this is interesting. I think these are all interesting data points that you're gonna pull on. And so, you know, if this is like, I think, you know, there's, there's product uh, market and then there's team, right? I think there, you're gonna be, as an investor, you're trying to pull from how much you can learn about, you know, de-risking on each of those points, right? So team, maybe they have some really interesting background, they have a unique uh, perspective, unique insight. For, um, for product, maybe there's just like really, really defensible technology. So for example, the one I was just talking about, there was 20 years or plus, uh, 15 plus years of R&D that was going into that technology. Yes, they didn't have a product yet, but the technology background was really, really impressive. So there's mm -hmm. a huge quotient there. Um, or you have a market that's just completely disjointed and it makes a ton of sense to build a, um, a company that goes, is going after that. So if you have you know, all three of those things, you're great. If you have at least two of those things, that's, so, that's sorry. can Defensible be good technology, disjointed market. What was the third one? Uh, just a killer team. Okay. Yeah. So Product LOI may not be that important, right? Well, it, it's a data point. I mean, if, if you have a, uh, a early customer that's raising their hand and saying, yes, this is a product that I want to see built, that's a very strong data, yes. data point. And a lot of times you may even have, you know, uh, connections at some of these companies where you can talk to and say, is this, is this a real trend? Is this something that is, is happening? And you know, as an investor, you, you do those yeah. sorts of things. Depending on what kind of technology, you might also want to look to investors that specialize in those spaces. That under, you know, that, that was probably something that would be helpful in that context of folks who, one, do that kind of investing. Uh, as, you know, we, as uh, investors, we also, we, we have to go out and raise funds too. We were talking about this ourselves and we raise from folks on a, we do this style of investing, this is what you're gonna get from us. So you would wanna go to a fund that kind of has the ability mm -hmm. to do those kind of investments and has that kind of expertise because they're going to be able to wanna maybe understand that market or to like have the ability to kind of invest in things like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, there, there's, you don't wanna waste time on investors that you're pretty sure are, are just not in the right category, right? Like they might just ignore hardware altogether or not gonna invest in hardware or they're, you know, but, I don't but think you'd want to go to an ed tech. But that's you know, pretty easy to figure out. Just go to the website and see who they're investing in already. I mean, yeah. it's mm -hmm. pretty easy. All right, I got some other things. So actually, we had a lot of do's on investing. I want to know what are some classic don'ts that you see specifically around seed. And we can talk about Series A too, but let's start with seed. What are some classic don'ts that are mistakes? And, like, and, you, and you really, it's one of those things where you're like, yeah. Oh, I know you mean well, but come on. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's I don't say. know that that varies a lot by stage. I think it's like, you mean like pitching wise? Any, any element that, any yeah. element that they're just, they kind of blew it and they're like, ah, oh, there's just one, there's one thing that. that does come to mind for me. It's, it's, um, well, I think this is, a, this goes under the overarching bucket of kind of like overselling where you, where you are really, um, with both the company and the fundraise. So um, one thing that sometimes I see come across from you know, first time CEOs or first time fundraisers are uh, they might start name dropping a bunch of things. So they'll, they'll name yes. drop that they met with 
XYZ firm, you know, on Sandhill. Hill. They, all know um, they, you know, venture investors they talk a lot yeah. with each other. So there's um, when you when you say something like that, uh, that might come back to bite you because. So I will tell you a quick joke. <laughs> I have a friend who used to meet with investors, yeah. and he would drop my name, and I said. You know I don't have any influence, <laughs> and it was like, why are you dropping my name? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they also sometimes it'll be funny because they'll be like popping between us, and we're like texting each other as we're friends. You know, it's like a <laughs> it's a tight knit kind right. of community in that way. Um, I mean, I think there's just some fundamentals you want to have in place before you go looking to raise, and so and that's just like a more around pitching, but thinking about your business model, but knowing just like all the pieces you want to have, you want to definitely have a perspective on the market opportunity. You want to make sure that you have a sense of like how much you want to raise and why and what it's for. And like some folks will ask you for five million, like what's it for, and they're like they just like picked a number. Um, well, well, let, all right, then let's skip to that. Let's skip to that right now. How do you value? How do I? How do I? You know. First of all, when people are coming up with money, I'm assuming they're saying this money is to hire X number of people to purchase this That's much product. That's what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't. They just come up with a number and go, what do you need that? What do you need that for? They Sometimes. Just, I mean, Sometimes. people who are on top of it will have a clear, it's, it's not even like this people, but it's for what milestones. And mm -hmm. so thinking about, I want to hit X milestones in this amount of time. And to hit those milestones, I need this kind of development on my product and this kind of sales. That means I need these amount of salespeople and these amount of engineer, whatever. Like it's it's around thinking about in terms of milestones yeah. that you're going to achieve. Also in thinking about if you're if you are committed to going through the venture route, like what do you need for the next route? And so you have to have that in mind too. Because some folks will try to raise too little where you're not going to get to a place where you're going to be attractive for a series A investor or a series B investor. So it's about milestones. In yeah, terms of I think that's an important point. And it goes back to your last question too is where I see this mistake happen a lot where you know, um, we're raising $5 million because we want to get 18 months of runway. And it's like, okay. Um, that gets me what? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and then, you know, you know you're going to have to raise another round. Yeah. And unless you're just going to be profitable, you're going to have to raise another round in probably 12 to 15 months in order to, you know, get to the next round. of. So, yeah, it's, it's much more about what are the key milestones. And it, it actually shows a lot of um, kind of foresight when yes. they have a really, really good answer for, you know, we've done a lot of research. We've talk, talked to a lot of people. We feel like... To, to raise a good Series B in this market, you know, for yes. this opportunity, Zippers. we're going to need to hit like X million of revenue and have these many customers and so yada, the, yada, yada. So the ones who come for your seed but are playing out the entire story to the is next attractive round, or just to the next round? At least to that. And then I think you want a perspective on a couple of years out. We know that's not going to be accurate, but like you want to, you, it's also about thinking about the, I don't, we don't want to go too far this on this path, but like the economics of venture investing, like there's horizon that you're looking at and you have to get to certain like growth stages at certain times. Um, so just having that in mind as part of, you're thinking about the speed at which you're going to grow or get to certain milestones. Okay. All right. So let's, let's go to, to valuation. I mean, I mean, is there anything you can value at seed round? It's, it's very hard to place a value on a, a startup at a seed round. So at that point, you're really just saying, I need this to achieve this, and that's it. Like, you're not putting any value on the product. Well, I mean, it, it, you're also, each investor is going to be thinking about the next round down the road, right? And right. so, you know, for a Series A, there's a lot of times there's a little bit more baked out, um, you know, I guess, valuation metrics somewhat, although it, it's all over the map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of know generally where you're going to be for the, a Series A kind of range of outcomes. Mm -hmm. So for a seed round, you're obviously going to be at a discount to that, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think more often than not, it's a pretty basic uh, math equation of we're raising, we need to raise $2 million, we need to raise whatever, $1, $2 million. Um, the lead investor is going to uh, probably expect this much ownership. You know that the founder is going to expect taking this much dilution. There's mm -hmm. a negotiation that happens there um, because you know, also the, the, the invent venture investor doesn't want to see the company get too diluted either, right? right? Because then you're not going to have trouble raising your next round. There's going to be a whole problem on the cap table. So it's a, lot, it's a lot of fitting those puzzle pieces, I think. All right. Um, so let's, let's talk about price round versus convertible note in the round structure. I don't even know what the hell that means. I just have a little note here. I need to ask <laughs> What does that mean? Uh, when you, well, I'll let you talk more about this. I don't uh, do seed sides, but uh, price is when you are valuing the company and right. the convertible notes. Uh, well, you could have a price in there, but it's, um, it's a different structure that's an easier way that you don't have to do evaluation in the same way that you do on a price round. Yeah, and also it depends on, it, it depends, there's a lot of factors here, but the yeah. convertible note, you're, you're not actually setting a formal right. price 
on that round yet, right? But a lot of what times there's. What are you there's... saying? What, what are you saying? <laughs> giving you X you're... amount of for good. Well, yeah, no, no, no. You're, 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 uh, that investor is going to invest X amount of dollars in this company, which will convert into the next round of funding, that, so the Series A, for example, Got it. Okay. Um, at whatever price. And then a lot of times there's a discount, a discount or a cap, a valuation cap. So um, when you do a convertible note with a cap on it, it's almost like you're pricing the round because mm -hmm. you're saying, I'm going to invest $1 million at a $10 million valuation cap um, and a 20% discount. So if it goes over the uh, $10 million, then you're always, the, um, that investor is going to convert their shares at the $10 million valuation. If it's under that, then you're getting a 20% discount to that next round. So okay. there's, you are putting a general price on it. However, you don't know exactly where that Series A is going to come in at. Oh. It's very confusing, but yeah. <laughs> it no, no, I, I generally understand. <laughs> it, there's more seed. Convertible notes can be better to seed round because you don't have as much to price on, and it's also like an easier legal transaction um, because it's very expensive um, to do all of the like just the legal side is expensive when you do. Let me ask a really simple question. <laughs> What's the best way to get a meeting with you and you? I want a meeting. I want a pitch. What's the best way to do it? So the very best meeting or best way is the way that we all get in trouble for, which is like another investor or a friend or someone in my network introducing, um, which I recognize is like a, a, it's a frustrating answer uh, because it feels like it creates a barrier to uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say um, we also, because we want to be very, and you, this is a term that's used frequently, entrepreneur friendly, um, we have an open um, submission where you could submit business plans and we read every single one of them and respond to every single one of them. And if it's kind of in the stage. What percentage of those do you see? So what do you mean by see? Talk to? Talk to, yeah. Uh, a smaller percentage, but if you're in like the, if you're in the met, like the range of like a series A and an education, I'm likely to talk to you just to understand what you're doing, to understand like if there's ways, you might not be a fit for me, but you might be a great fit for another fund that I work with and I want to be helpful to them. So, you know, generally speaking, uh, we want to be really friendly and be as helpful to the ecosystem as we can. Um, okay. So I think the, the easiest way is when someone from your, introduces you directly, but there's certainly ways that, not all funds do this, but we certainly do have direct submissions that we review, and review all the time. Let me ask, at a networking event, someone comes up to you and says, I, w I want to pitch something, how well does that go over? Well, it, I don't. I don't. I think you just kind of start talking. It's not like I want to pitch something. That, that's well, because I think no, but I think if you've definitely been chased. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that have been hammered. Before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, if if it's compelling and if it's directed, and a lot of times it's, it's all about context. And, and to your point about introduction, if you can create some sort of context around um, the introduction, that's super helpful. It could be someone that the investor knows, or it just could be you know. Look, uh, I read this blog post that you wrote about the space, and it's really relevant to me because my startup. You might find this interesting. That's going to create better context yeah. as to just launching into a yes. pitch. So flattery works with you, Phil. Is that what you're saying? Well, okay. I think the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's really about congratulating me on something first, and then. I'm Which, by the way, I want to tell you that just works in general. <laughs> if you want someone to listen to you, acknowledge them first. Period. Well, it just works. I do think, and I'm not sure. I don't want to speak for Phil, but I do also think like. This is, is my job to look at business plans. Like it is, I don't look at it as like a thing that I don't want to see. So I want to see it. I want to see as much as possible. I want to know what's happening, um, and I want to talk to as many people as possible. So it's part of the mindset I think of when you're in these roles that you you want to see as many. But I, as I'll tell you a perfect example. I was so I'm not an investor, but I was doing this monitoring panel at a at a startup conference uh, not too long ago, and like three people just came up to me and just started hammering me. And I couldn't understand one word that they were saying, yes, mostly because, either way, English wasn't their first language. That had a lot to do with it. It wasn't that I didn't understand the topic, it's just I didn't understand all the words that were coming out of their mouth. Um, but they're so eager to tell their story, and I understand that eagerness, but they, they just don't know the approach. And so, mm -hmm. let, let me just, I meet you at a networking event like this, I haven't read your blog post yet. What's the best way to approach you? Well, I, again, I still think it is about creating context. The context yeah. is really that you know, it's 
it's it's it's it, just as anything. You don't want you want to understand what the other person in the Looking conversation for. you know yeah. understands and knows about the world before launching into a uh, a pitch or a, or an ask from them, mm -hmm. right? So it's 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 better to create you know an organic discussion, um, you know about a marketer, you know. Um, you know, try, try to engage them a little bit first and understand their level of interest. If, if it's not even going to be a fit at all, it's better that the entrepreneur know that, know that up front yeah. anyway versus, you know, wasting your bullets on, on pitching. Well, it's kind of when your question's around, like, what should you do or don't do? I, I think some folks, uh, when, they're, when they do pitch, you should have a good sense of, like, what that fund invested. And this is, like, sounds silly, but people don't do this sometimes. Like, what they invest in, what their portfolio looks like, like, what stage, what size checks. Like, that's all public information. You can see that stuff. And so just having that context uh, creates a better, like, conversation when you're yeah, on yeah. the same page. Well, so, and also you appreciate, like, oh, you spent all of 10 minutes doing your research. Yes. Excellent. I appreciate right. that. That's awesome. All right. Uh, just keeping on time. We have about 15 minutes. Yes, Gabrielle. Hold on. So um, a lot of it's about getting money, and I always like question, should you just take the money whenever you have the money? By the way, it is called fundraising. It's whenever. fundraising. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also, like, you also want people who are connected and actually going to support mm -hmm. you in growing your business. What do you find the balance of doing that? And if someone, let's say someone's pitching for you, they're also kind of interviewing you yes. in a way. And like, how would you recommend as a good approach to do that? I've heard like people asking things that you failed at with other startups that maybe not work. Would, would you be offended by a question like that? Um, I think, so one of the, it's also, again, kind of goes that investment thesis, like we lead our rounds, we take board seats, so that is a very active, uh, that's a part of our value add is like we are money plus portfolio services and that's how we frame ourselves as a fund. And so a lot, folks will directly ask like, you know, if, if you were to invest in us, like how would you imagine helping us? And we say, these are the services that we offer, this is why we are structured this way. And that's, I think, a totally valid and, and real question that you should have a great understanding of um, when you're thinking about various partners. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very we talk about that all the time with companies that are pitching. No, I think I think that's important. I think it's it's always a good thing to ask is kind of how do you work with startups? Yeah. What's your what's your typical value add? Um, you know, if that question isn't asked, I usually try to ask at the end like, what are you, what looking, are you looking for in an yeah. investor? Because it's just a good conversation to have, and it actually shows. Um, you know, even throwing it back on them, like the types of questions that they're asking, I think it's, it shows kind of thoughtfulness yes. that they want to find someone who's going to be a partner, not just you know source of capital. Because I think that doesn't create the right relationship between mm -hmm. investor. And By the way, I mean I've heard of this happening. I'm wondering if you guys have done it. Have you ever a situation where you absolutely love the team or love specific members of the team, but hate the idea and or think oh there's no market whatsoever, and you're like, we are going to work together, and I'm going to move you to something else. Have you done that? <laughs> I haven't done that, but I've certainly had folks pitch where love the entrepreneur, like the idea, the way they thought about the market I didn't think was quite right. And so I've talked about like, well, if I were going to size this market, this is how I would do it. <laughs> like, I've certainly done things like that, but I haven't like tried to shove people in a totally different direction. Because I think you have to have the passion for what you're working on to, to do the hard work of a startup. I mean, I think there's, there's um, I think it, it for at least us at the stage we're investing in, it's people first is like the number one thing. If we find a really, really compelling entrepreneurs and it's maybe a market that's still pretty early on in development, like, you know, the market thing will be a, a minus, but we may just love this entrepreneur so much that we want to, you know, invest in whatever they're doing. However, I will say that, um, you know, I, I think part of it is just understanding that, you know, as an investor, you may not know that market as well mm -hmm. as that entrepreneur Absolutely. you're investing in. So there's, there's certain leaps of faith you're going to have to take on on the market if you really believe in the entrepreneur. You you know you're, you're going to have to probably believe that there's a there's a market opportunity there. Similar but on opposite. Have you ever a situation where someone has pitched you, and you just flat out say, "Come back to me when you can say A, B, and C," yeah. and they do come back oh, yeah. to you. Absolutely. That happens all yep. the time. Yes. And have they pulled it off? Yes. Yeah. And you were impressing. You actually mm -hmm. invested in them. Yes. Yeah, no, I think I think it definitely happens. There's, there's, that's the other thing I was thinking when you were asking that question is like, you know, uh, there's plenty of times where we actually do pass on an entrepreneur that we really, really like, and it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, but it's just something was missing. There was, it was too, too early on with product or just too early on in that market, mm -hmm. um, and eventually maybe something they come back and they're addressing a different market or they've landed a couple of customers that shows that hey, maybe we were wrong about that yeah. market. I think uh, there's yeah. And I'd say from this, the A. Um, you know, I think it's good 
uh, to start to develop relationships with other investors. And like, so for example, a number of our companies we've invested in, we've, we've met them at the seed. Um, we help them with their seed maybe even, like introduce them to other folks that were the right stage for them, track them over time, and then led their next round. And so it's certainly a thing um, that is helpful is to, to have some form of relationship, at least at the A, I'm not sure exactly on the seed, mm -hmm. prior to asking for, like, to, to lead around right when you're trying to raise. Mm -hmm. So that can be really helpful. I do think there's an art to it, though, around uh, the type of conversation you're having. So if you're a seed stage company and you're talking to a Series A investor who you know you might want to have down the road, like, framing the conversation that way is, a, I think, helpful, um, even if you are raising, to say, like, I understand this is what you mm -hmm. normally do, but I want to, like, let you know what we're up to and see what your thoughts are, and then sending notes or whatever along the way, having a call every once in a while to update folks is good, uh, but making sure you're being mindful of the time that uh, that investor has. Some folks will want to do it all the time, which can be tough, um, but I think it's a good way of starting to build a relationship over time, and mm -hmm. it might not be the right stage now, but it might be yeah. in 18 months, 24 months, whatever. And another thing that happens all the time is that you meet an entrepreneur too late in their fundraising process. Yes. I'm sure this happens to you all the time, it happens to us. You know, they may be raising, for example, they might be raising a seed round and there's only like 500K yes, left in the and round and there's not enough room for another partner like us. So we'll, you know, we'll track uh, those entrepreneurs very, very closely to get to the next round. And it's always a very, very good idea for CEOs that are raising money um, to really be like maniacal about keeping track of every conversation you have in each fundraise round and keep a spreadsheet, do the whole thing because you know, it could, it could come around in like six months where if you're sending updates to the, your favorite investors that you met with that just for whatever reason it wasn't a fit, and then those things can kind of come together and sometimes a preemptive round yes. comes together where you don't have to go out and do a full yeah. fundraise process. I would recommend a CRM over a spreadsheet. Yes. It's a better technology. <laughs> CRMs are great. Uh, <laughs> I'd be overkill, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's just, just, uh, just shifting gears a little bit. One thing we talked about previously before this was about just to talk about the current health of the venture market. Um, what I currently always see, not currently, what I always see is some company skyrockets and there's a bunch of Me Too companies and there's a slew of investing in that one sort of topic. And it just happens time and time again. And it's, you know, it, it happens all the time. Are we still seeing that right now? How healthy is the venture market? Um, is there silly money being thrown away? Thrown away because I often see that, or is it a little bit more intelligent? I'll, I'll, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think there's there's um, there is a lot of uh, capital out in the market right now, and there's there's been very very large funds that have been raised um, that are even you know directed toward early stage mm -hmm. uh, companies, which uh, I think you know. It's great because there's there's you know startups and innovation and there's gonna be a lot of really really good companies that are built because of this amount of capital that's out there and available. Um, but I also think that it can create um, you know some maybe some some bad kind of habits that are, yeah. that are uh, created. And I think there's gonna and be comes yeah and 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 it cannot honestly and we were talking about this a little bit before. There's certain companies that um, you know shouldn't necessarily be venture companies shouldn't raise venture capital. Um, it's better to you know. Start with a uh, try to bootstrap the business, get it profitable as soon as possible, and then you know run run after it. Hold it. So, what companies are those that shouldn't shouldn't look for investment? Well, because venture capital creates a there's a um, you know you're basically everyone around the table at that point is looking for a very very large outcome in order to create the economics that makes sense. So, service based capital. organizations that aren't going to scale to a certain yeah. level and aren't going to become like massively you know. There's uh, just no profitable. point in it. You have to think about the exit and the yeah. all of that longer. It's not even there's no point to it. It can kill the business, yes. right? Like mm -hmm. it could, because the incentives are aligned so that this business has to be a very, very large outcome, yes. a potential right. billion dollar business, yes. right? And most businesses aren't are not, yeah. going to be that. So if you create a situation where, you know, the max outcome for the business was maybe a you know, uh, a few million dollars of profit and just kind of operating profitably from there, then that business may die because the expectations are misaligned. They yes. raise way too much capital mm -hmm. and they're never able to you yes. know, reach the next stage. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do that business, you should capitalize it differently. Right. Like, um, exactly. it's go, just to, a, go to the bank and get a loan. Right, yeah. and there's just different ways of financing and venture is an inherently risky, there are riskier investments for higher return profiles for the investors that invest in let's, us. Let's go through also how, you, when someone is looking for money, 
how do they value what percentage of the company they're giving up? Like, or like, how does that? How do you calculate that? <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it is um, you got to think about your, for your business how much capital are you really going to need to raise in order to become profitable and self-sustaining or reach some exit yeah, outcome. Yeah, but right? like, first of all, what is the number that you get? Like, what percentage? Like, I wouldn't it look at this for under <laughs> X percentage. And then two, like, I mean, literally, I could pick a, pick a number. I could say twenty or twenty-five percent. I could say five mm -hmm. percent or nine percent. Like. It, it literally, you pick a number out of the air when you're at the beginning, and it wouldn't mean anything, or you, you wouldn't know because between five and twenty-five percent, if a company barely does anything, it means nothing. Right. Well, my point was with looking at uh, in the beginning how much capital you're going to need to raise because uh, there's a certain dilution. If you're going to need to raise like hundred million dollars, there's a certain dilution that would just make no sense to take for a, a one million dollar. So that's right? why you need to see multiple rounds ahead. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you have alone. to look ahead to understand yes. what, so how much capital you, is this business say, going to need. I need the C, but at yeah. Series A, I'm going to need this, and Series right. B, I'm going to need. Yes. So if you don't see that, and they're saying ask, and they're going to give you X percentage, you're like, I, I don't even know what this means because I can't do the math down the road, or you can do the math. I mean, I, I don't know. We can do it, but <laughs> math can be done. But there's, hold it. I mean, are you for, for example, actually, are you purposely <laughs> holding back the math right now? No, no. Well, it I varies. Mean, it varies a lot. It, 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 does, it varies, and it's it's all about when you decide to go after that funding round, how much you've proven, and how yeah. much you need to raise or asking to raise. Because there there's certain situations where maybe the, the business should be valued at ten million dollars. Um, so do you want to take ten million dollars of funding right now, or do you want to take two million dollars of funding right now? Because right. your dilution will be a lot less yes. if you take less yeah, money. Yeah, but at seed, you can't value anything at this point. Well, that, that's yeah, my that's my point where. Yeah, that's my point where it goes down to what do you need to prove to get to the next range, round of capital? Um, what are what are rounds going at that uh, stage? And so that really, business? you have to compare yes. to like companies, see what they did, mm -hmm. see what they offered percentage wise. Is that all the information public or no? Not mm. that kind of stuff. Not kind of no. Stuff. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. so you wouldn't you'd have to kind of do some weird or basic math and then <laughs> essentially. If someone shows you, quote, their math, you may or may not agree with it, that would be the way they would create some kind well, of percentage. And you still do want it, like, you don't want to dilute your CEOs down. You want them to be incentivized to be building this company to a large exit for you. So mm -hmm. there's there's certainly a range that people will be comfortable with, and I, I've seen a very large yeah, range. Yeah, you don't want a situation where the CEO only has 2% of the company in the right. end. Right, and, like, you, not and their company, anything. if that happens, your, your investor probably going to insist on upping your option. Like, they're going to want you to feel incentivized for the exit, right? right. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. your early, especially early stage investors are going to be, um, I want to say on your side, but yeah, like it's once we invest in you, we are all, we're incentivized to help you build a, a big business. So that percentages for you have to exist where there's enough incentive. Yes. yes. So yes. does that mean at seed stage, we come with an expectation of what seed a, uh, series A would be? You want the entire picture? In terms of the... So when you say give the, give the future landscape, meaning let's say you say, Seed is two million, but assuming seed is successful, then seed is able looking at another two million. You want that answer on day one itself? Is that the projections you're looking at? And the way you said, give the future future line of sight as well. I mean, you're not you're not going to know exactly how much capital you're going to need to raise the Series A and at what valuation because you're but you're assuming that you're going to hit a certain milestone. So yeah. part of the series, the seed pitch is. We think we're going to, you know, get to X milestone. Maybe it's a million dollars of revenue. Maybe it's a certain customer, and then, you know, from there, it's it's a little bit easier to figure out what your valuation and uh, how much capital you're probably going to need to raise at that point it, in order to get there, right? It so. also goes back to the like the milestones are related to the growth of the the speed of the growth of business towards an eventual exit, right? And so that, it's not going to be exactly uh, accurate, right? But it has to be like, uh, what's the word like? Plausible, right? And like, but you expect that, right? The but you're also, yeah, but you're also way. Correct me if I'm wrong. To ask the question, what's your minimum percentage? That wouldn't mean anything. What you want is a combination of what's the potential rate of success here, mm -hmm. and how much are we going to get out of it? So, what is we have a 50% chance of getting 10 million versus an 80% chance of getting 1 million? You know, like, mm -hmm. so. You must, correct me if I'm wrong, you must have to operate on something like that, and you do must have a minimum at something. We're not going to, I don't want a 100% chance of getting $1,000, you know, but I'm willing to risk, you know, 
X percentage to get for, you know, yeah. you know, usually it's not that high a percentage, yeah. but X percentage to get a huge reward. Are you, are you calculating that way? Yeah, at, at these stages, you're, you're investing so early and we're all, if we wouldn't invest if you didn't think this could be a massive, massive outcome, right? right? So, you, so all you're thinking is this has to be huge, not this has to be $3 million. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, it has to be huge, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Last question. So is, is the decision to take venture capital as binary as you can be a billion dollar company or not, or is it more nuanced and you could still have a successful exit at 500 million? Well, fine. That's half that, a billion. That, makes, still that, makes, that gets you guys where you need to go. On, and that might not be for an investor, though. It depends on how much they gave you and what. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, 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 there has to be the, poten the potential for a massive business. And we can call that massive business a billion dollars or whatever we, we want to call it. But there has to be the potential that this company can become a very, very large company for the venture economics to work as a venture fund, right? So the downside, there might be mul multiple downside cases where it's much less than what happens, but it, it, because there's that potential, that's why at the early yeah. stage you're willing to make that, that, and that, that risky gets, bet. Right? That gets into the portfolio math. There's like lots of writing about this too, but the portfolio math, right? Like, it ha like you have to have certain um, pot potential exits like that in order to think about the entire portfolio construction and what you're going yeah. to return to your investors eventually. All right, this guy has I a just question. Want to comment about the if you're six, six founders and you're going to see a seed round and you're raising one million, eventually in one B you wouldn't will have like one percent of the company. So it's really depends on the team that you're starting with and who is the stuff when you raise money. Sometimes you just need that million because you already all the founders are working for small salary. But sometimes you need one million because you're just a CEO and some other guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, it really depends on all these things before you go to approach to anyone. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it's, it's, it's the other thing is, and, and uh, you were talking about this earlier, is that you know, the, the, if you're raising uh, you know, a certain amount of money and the venture investor is not going to want to take 100% of your company, right? Because you guys aren't, no one in that company is going to work. You know, they're not going to want to take 80% of the company because splitting up 20%, you're still not that incentivized. So there's a number that makes sense somewhere in there. And then there's also the other side of the table where you know, we've proven this much, so we're not, we're not diluting ourselves yeah. 50%, right? So there's... It's just negotiation. Yeah. No, no, there's there's no absolute, sure. Okay, <laughs> I want to thank you again. Again, Ashley Bittner to my immediate left, who's with uh, Al Ventures and Phil Boyer with Crosslink Capital. I want to thank Pitch Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And anybody else you need to thank? No? Oh, and Pimo. Base, and Startup. Basecamp, base camp, which is where we're at. And to our audience. Facebook viewers, thank you, and thank you to our, our studio audience as well. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Here, let's clap really thank loud. You. <laughs> thank you.